all throughout this process, what we've described is where we're examining, the routers are examining this destination address field. They, of course, do examine and do modify more fields than that, but uh, just uh, specifics in this, this is the, in the IPv4 packets. And we have an animation of all the, our packets moving through the network forward on a hop-by-hop, -hop, router by router basis. <coughs> Analogous to the model that you saw, where we have a, quite a specific breakdown between software and hardware, uh, in any common router design, whether it's uh, a uh, development platform like the NetFPGA or the highest end of the, uh, the Junipers and, and Cisco's through to uh, the quite small home hubs and so on, they often take up this breakdown where we have hardware and software. The hardware, it's uh, forwarding tables, the hardware lookup tables quite often, switching fabric which is mechanisms essentially for just moving the packet to the right destination and in collaboration with that we have a group of software, we have routing protocols on a tiny uh, home hub, uh, a wireless access point or something like that, the routing protocols can be quite uh, uh, negligible and of course the routing protocols at, at top end systems might include the full blown BGP, OSPF and, and so on. Uh, at that stage we also have those routing protocols populating a routing table and there will be some great globs of management software, some sort of interfaces, uh, some switches of course have web interfaces and others have command line, typically CLI as you move up the stack uh, for the more sophisticated systems. Now, we kind of lied. The packets per packet processing per router is not quite as trivial as looking up the destination. There's actually more to it than that. But it's not much more. Uh, first of all, take in the packet, so that means we've got an available uh, buffering space for it. Uh, that might not always be the case. Uh, we do the lookup of the address. Uh, we do a trivial amount of manipulation, as it turns out, decrementing the TTL because we know that uh, the IP headers carry a time to live field and when that reaches one, zero, there's a certain circumstance, the packet is discarded, stops our packet circulating the internet forever. And we update the header checksum, buffer the packet in preparation, and then it's transmitted on an outgoing link. So this, this is the generic architecture of our IP router, the um, you know, any, any man router. So we have our, our uh, data come in, the header does the address lookup, update, quite often it's a combined unit, uh, queues the packet and out it goes. And of course the address lookup is a, uh, a reference into the forwarding table, the return from the forwarding table is, is which outbound interface to send it to, uh, and the packet's buffered, typically it's buffered in shared memory in most router models but that's not always the case. It, it's uh, buffered in, in a group of memory and then when the uh, outbound interface can, it'll send it on its way. The routing of destination packets, so we'll just provide a little bit of background because you'll see that has become quite important the way we structured this, uh, um, these configurations and if there's some of you wanting to take this idea away with you, you, you appreciate that uh, um, the forwarding process, uh, the building the forwarding table is not, not quite as, uh, as trivial as it first appears. Um, but essentially, for some time now, we've been using CIDR. Uh, it's a more efficient way of populating the address base in IP. And at the bottom of this, uh, at the bottom of this uh, slide, we have uh, all of IP space represented as a line segment. And each subsegment above it, I can't remember. Yeah, so each subsegment above it represents a, an address block, set of destinations. And we can see not every destination is valid in this particular representation. Uh, it might be addresses that either we send through some default, but more likely they might simply be not treated by this router at all. And we can see that uh, slash 16, it, it's, it represents a certain length on the line. The, uh, the CIDR prefixing is just a, a little bit more flexible than the old uh, class addresses that we did many years ago. So what is actually happening? We have an inbound address, 128.9.16.14. We come look it up and it's treated by... It's, it's, sorry, I'm just going to grab my laser. It's a bit better than John's. Um, so it's treated in this net block and this net block will represent 
a handling in the route, a particular destination route, a particular outbound port, so it'll have an entry uh, in that respect. But of course, we know that there's subnetting possible, so we might actually have uh, sets of subsetting, and this is where we're looking for the most specific address match. And in this particular case, we've got quite a large block, 16, uh, slash 16 addresses, and within that, we've got two slash 20s. They might have a different destination. And within that, maybe a couple of slash 24s. These are quite small. These are only 256 hosts, of course. So now we have our inbound address. The reference that looks up, uh, it may be that it does match this one, but actually it also matches this. And once again, we're looking for the most specific entry, the longest uh, prefix that we can match, it's this one. And it doesn't have a match to any of these. Great. We know where to send it. There's actually been an enormous amount of work in longest prefix match. And it's, it's still quite a hot topic because uh, every time a new piece of silicon technology comes out, suddenly a whole new approach to the longest prefix match can be taken on. Uh, obviously, there's just trivial linear searches. If you've got a relatively small table, this works brilliantly well, but uh, starts to fail for routers as they move up the hierarchy, as they, their routing tables are, are more fully populated. Uh, direct lookup might be where you actually contain the entire memory map block. Problem is, it's quite exhaustive of memory, especially when you have a full, um, a full table. And in fact, in the worst representation of this, this would take a you, know, you could imagine it has 2 to the 32 entries, which is just impractical. Various forms of trees, there's also been some uh, bloom filter work in there. And uh, one of the most common methods that's currently out there is the use of TCAMs in some form. TCAMs are very lovely, but they're incredibly power, uh, power hungry. And so in uh, the design space for routers, where we're trying to work to build uh, more power efficient routers, uh, there's been a an enthusiastic move away from TCAMs through the use of some uh, quite quite a lot of smart algorithm work. So, if we have a look at our IP router in the in the context of NetFPGA, we have this once again this software and hardware breakdown. The management CLI is represented to us by the Java interfaces, as we're hearing John talking about. There's obviously exception processing and so on, where you've got to manually manipulate packets and we'll see examples of that further through the day. And we have a routing protocol. We know that was the OSPF uh, in, uh, instance that we're running on these machines and routing tables. And of course, in the Verilog, in the hardware implementation on the FPGA, we have the forwarding tables, forwarding table lookup mechanism, and uh, the, the switching mechanisms. So the destination, to elect the destination ports. So what we end up with is quite a nice little router. It's uh, you know, four gigabit Ethernet ports, which is ample enough to do uh, quite a bit of experimentation with. Fully programmable. This is a bit of an ad. You know, remind you why you're here. It's low cost. It sings. It dances. It jumps up and down. And uh, it's got a full open source uh, FPGA uh, implementation in Verilog. Um, and of course, all the drivers, all the all the software system is is actually just in C or C++. So familiar to, to most of programmers as well.